This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. Subscribe to Bloomberg Surveillance On Demand on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And always on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Joining us now from Washington is Julie Sue, the acting U.S. Labor Secretary. Acting Labor Secretary, wonderful to catch up with you. It always is. I want to go back to 8.30, just briefly if we can. I got a lot of feedback at 8.30 Eastern Time about not being able to access the BLS website to get this information, to get this data. I'm told that the message they got on the screen was you were blocked from the BLS website. What was going on at 8.30? What was the difficulty? I don't know what happened with the website. I will say that um, our jobs numbers today show that 199,000 jobs were added last month, uh, that we have the lowest unemployment rate for the longest period of time since Diana Ross was at the top of the charts, um, and it reflects uh, continued steady growth in our economy. I'm sorry to hear that you weren't able to get that, but I'm happy to talk about any of the data that's come out. Well, let's talk about it coming out next month and the month after that and the month after that. Can we revisit the lockup, Julie, and have a lockup and make sure this data gets out efficiently and effectively, given it's probably the most important data point on the planet? I completely agree on the importance of the data. Um, you know, we come out to talk about it every time because it demonstrates the health of the economy. It demonstrates, uh, you know, whether economic policies are working. And what we've seen is steadily uh, since President Biden came into office, 14.1 million jobs created, again, broad based across uh, numerous sectors, low unemployment rates and real wages rising. So we are very happy to make sure that you are getting the information that you need to help us tell the story about the impact of Bidenomics across the country. You really don't want to talk about this, do you? Oh, no, I'm not trying to avoid it. I, I, I obviously believe that the data has to be available. But it's not. To all of you. And it wasn't. So how can we fix that for next month? I hear you on that. Okay. Maybe you should, can respond to me in the future at some point in the next week or so, and, and I can share that answer to our listeners and our viewers. Let's talk about the data. On the surface, it looks great. This is from Catholic Economics this morning. The response from them this morning, just going beneath the surface, respectable organizations saying this, the 199 increase in November, payroll employment included 47 workers, 47,000 workers returning from strikes. Stripping out that one-off boost, the 152 gain was roughly the same as the muted increase in October. Moreover, of that 152, 49,000 with government jobs, a further 77K in healthcare. Excluding those non cyclical sectors, the economy added only 26,000 jobs, which adds to the evidence that after a very strong third quarter, growth is slowing to a crawl in the fourth quarter. Judy, what would you make of that? I think what we're seeing is, again, we look at overall trends in the economy. We've seen uh, job growth at record rates, certainly faster than anybody predicted coming out of the pandemic. But it wasn't just like, you know, one time boost in the immediate post pandemic months. It's been um, year over year growth. Uh, we, we're also seeing it across numerous industries and we're seeing it in, you know, overall, right? Over 800,000 jobs created in, uh, in construction, over 600,000 in manufacturing since President Biden came into office. And yes, we also saw workers come back on the payroll after strikes that resulted in record wage increases and other kinds of um, benefits, retirement benefits, health benefits that we really associate with what we want for working people, right? It's what gives families a sense of security. It's what gives individuals what the president always talks about, which is some breathing room. And that's the kind of economy that we want to build, that we are are seeing we have more work to do and we'll continue to build on the progress that we've made many of the investments that the president has helped to make possible are showing up in communities 40,000 some infrastructure projects across 4,500 communities all across the country but we're just beginning with that and so we'll continue to see more of that and the jobs numbers are just another you know indicator of uh, of, of, of of that growth and what its impact means why do you think this is not resonating with the electorate I'll share 
recent poll, CNN, more than four in ten, saying they're seriously concerned rising costs could push them out of their own communities. Bloomberg, together with Morning Console, only 35 percent of voters in seven swing states trust Biden on the economy. Where's that disconnect coming from? Right. So one thing President Biden does talk a lot about, to your point, is we want to make sure that there are jobs in communities so people can get jobs and build, you know, build a family and join the middle class without leaving the place that they work, uh, that they live. I was with him when we went to Belvedere, Illinois, where a plant that had been shuttered is now being reopened because of the agreement between the UAW and the big three. I do think some of this is still, you know, we had global, uh, you know, pandemic and, and, you know, and, and, and the economic wreckage that resulted immediately in the aftermath of that. Again, we've grown back from it, but the sense of insecurity, I think, remains, and that's, that's legitimate. The other thing, I, you know, just from traveling around the country and talking to folks, is I think that part of this is that people really do see, um, you know, there's jobs being created, there's training programs that are connecting them to those jobs, but there remains deep inequities in our society, and part of that is the huge gap between CEO pay and frontline worker pay. So I talked about Diana Ross, I talked about the good news, that we are having unemployment levels at record lows for the longest stretches since 1970. In 1970, the disparity between CEO pay and frontline pay was something like 20%. Today, it's over, th 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 uh, um, uh, it was like 17 times higher the CEO pay from worker pay. Today it's something like 344 times. That doesn't feel fair to people. It doesn't feel good. And that's why President Biden talks about building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up where working people and working families do well, not just the wealthy. Yeah, he's had a lot to say about corporate America as well. I'm going to share a tweet from the president with you. And I want your thoughts on it. I want you to translate it if you can, because I don't understand it. It says, let me be clear to any corporation that hasn't brought their prices back down, even as inflation has come down. It's time to stop the price gouging, give American consumers a break. What is the president talking about? The president is saying that um, we have a job to do in this country and we want working people and uh, middle class families um, and every community across the country to have the things that, that, that they need to live a decent life. We want safe roads and new bridges. We want clean drinking water to flow out of every faucet. Yeah, I get that. We that's great. I want that too. But I, I, just this tweet specifically, inflation is slowing, well, but it's still positive. So prices are going up. But the president's saying inflation has come down. Why are corporations still price gouging? That's just, economically speaking, just absolutely flawed. So Acting Labor Secretary, who writes these tweets? What's he talking about? I mean, he's saying that we're all in this together and we will pursue economic policies that help to bring down prices and control inflation, but everyone's got a job to do on that. And we, you know, when there are record profits by companies who are uh, continuing to um, keep prices high, we'd like them to play their role in making sure that people can afford the basics they need in life. Appreciate it. Judy Sue, thank you. The acting U.S. Labor Secretary. We continue our conversation with Michael Darda, Chief Economist, Macro Strategist at Roth MKM. Michael, once again, it is a confounding report of somewhat towards a fully employed America. Is this the productivity overlay? Is this the technology overlay in the non-technological sectors where things are just simply better than we perceive? Well, it's hard to say, Tom. I mean, the productivity statistics have been really strong over the last two quarters, but they were insanely weak before that. So on productivity, we just vaulted back to the uh, to the uh, pre-pandemic trend uh, so far, which was 1.6% per annum. So to be determined on that question. This is a good report, you know, almost 200K with the downward revisions, you know, were at or just below the consensus expectation. But we were talking about the unemployment rate moving up to the cusp of a recession signal. Now we've pulled back to 3.7 on the unemployment rate. So this is a report the Fed is going to look at and not really feel compelled that they need to embrace these early rate cuts next year that the market
market has priced in. Now this could change again in you know with the December data, obviously, but at face value, strong report, almost 200k on payrolls, unemployment ticks by two tenths to three seven. That's going to be viewed as still a very tight, fully employed labor market. And so, you know, the, it makes sense that we're seeing a bit of risk off here and a, a bit of a bounce in, in bond yields. Michael, does this make you rethink any of your uh, thesis about the business cycle rolling over? Not so far. I mean, certainly it's not a, you know, it's not an additive decisive signal that, okay, this is, you know, if we're up at, you know, up above four uh, in the, you know, it, it, for this report, then, you know, to me, that would suggest that perhaps we've fallen into recession. So this says we're not in recession right now, uh, but it's not necessarily an all cl- clear signal for uh, for next year either. Michael, you fold with Bloomberg data, your economics into your equity coverage. What's the Darda SPX call for when you're 51 years old? <laughs> Tom, you know, we were talking before about the market really being dominated by two sectors and seven stocks. So, you know, I think for the overall S&P 500, we're going to have a challenging period. The valuations uh, in these leading sectors are simply too high. So I think investors are going to have to look to some other areas that have been underperforming where the valuations are low. But we'll have opportunities with rising volatility next year. Michael Darter, thank you so much with Roth MKM. This job's uh, day. Jeffrey Rosenberg is portfolio manager for the systematic multi-strategy fund at BlackRock. Je- uh, Jeff, with great respect, what's a strategy that works forward given the treacherous economic waters we wade? Yeah, this is a this is a good report, and as um, you know, we've been discussing you know across the board, it's a bit stronger than expected. You know, maybe not on the headline payrolls, but certainly underneath. And I think that really is going to push back, and I think that's why you've seen the market reaction, the initial market reaction that you just just just, just described is markets, bond markets in particular, were really starting to price in a lot of cuts into next year and pricing them earlier and earlier. Uh, 3.7% unemployment rate, hard to see where the restriction, the restrictiveness is coming for this Fed policy. So I think you're going to have a little bit of pushback in that narrative and that you're not really seeing the slowdown, particularly, again, with the wage picture. You know, most of the support here is coming from the inflation side, and we'll have that conversation next week. But on the growth side, you know, you're really not seeing the level of restrictiveness uh, show up yet in the labor markets. And I think that's going to push back on how quickly the Fed's going to be able to to, to cut rates to keep up with the, the right. fall in inflation and avoid, you know, the un, unintended increase in real, re- the real, in, real rates. In, in the Jeff's observation, Lisa, I missed this stunning. The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, I'm going to use this word carefully, explodes out to an accommodative 0.62. It's Greek, right? All you got to know is explodes the right word. This is what Powell does not want to see. Although he didn't push back as much as some people thought, at least uh, last week in his speech. But you're right to that point, Jeff, when you say that inflation is really the front uh, in the front minds of people who are betting on this Goldilocks narrative and even rate cuts without the pain. I wonder how much their view is damaged by average hourly earnings rising more than expected and rising from the prior month. How much does that suggest a stickiness to the labor market strength and wage growth uh, that really flies against this narrative of Fed rate cuts next year? A little bit. And and it there certainly goes in the opposite direction. But what you've had on the inflation side is really this dichotomy between goods and services. And it's the goods part that has really been the disinflation that's fueling the overall enthusiasm for the cuts into next year. The services side is held up and services inflation is really the mapping of today's labor report and the wage picture into the broader inflation. And, and so that you know remains very supportive. So again, it, it's it's kind of the easy disinflation is behind us. This report kind of supports continued so uh, uh, support for the broad inflation picture from the services side. And that debate, I think, will will continue. And obviously what you've seen in the market is a, a little bit of pullback 
in terms of the enthusiasm. You know, as Jonathan says, the first reaction isn't necessarily the end reaction. But I do think the overall take from this report and the wage picture is, again, very strong labor market, supportive of services inflation. Yes, it's still coming down. But most of that is being driven by the good side. You're not seeing that supported as much from the services side. You know, Priya Misra uh, of J.P. Morgan earlier this morning said, does it matter? She raised this question. Does it matter how much the Fed cuts rates uh, next year, considering the fact that it didn't seem to matter how much they raised rates? It didn't tighten policy that much. The long lags are long in both directions. Do you think that people are overestimating whether it matters if they cut rates in March or if they cut rates in June or if they cut rates in September, if they have stopped raising rates? And if right now what you're seeing is an economy that still is chugging along and businesses still hiring? Well, I think the question is, does it matter for the real economy or does it matter for the financial economy? I I think the point's well taken in terms of the sensitivity of the economy to interest rates uh, is a different question than the sensitivity to financial markets. And I think on the latter, the financial markets, it matters. It matters a lot. And I think that easing in financial conditions that you were just talking about has everything to do with the expectations of soft landing, the collapse in, in inflation, the immaculate disinflation proving out to be correct and allowing the Fed to cut interest rates. That's highly supportive of financial markets. Uh, The real economy point, yes, I would concede that may be less significant. But for investors, it's going to be the latter. It's going to be the financial market. Jeff, let's pretend you're at Carnegie Mellon. You've got to sum this over from your financial chat over into the GDP chat. Does this good labor economy support a more buoyant assessment of our real GDP? Well, I think so, Tom. And I think that's, you know, kind of the issue here for the monetary policy outlook is that there is this question of just what is neutral? What is real interest rates? What is restrictive? Uh, And we think we're there. Uh, but it, you don't know until it shows up. And, 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 and we've, we've had the benefit from the inflation side, but the growth side, uh, less so. And I think that's been the message from labor markets. It's been a steady normalization. Uh, but we're still seeing very strong labor market prints here, very strong wages, strong unemployment rates that are, are not really consistent with restrictiveness. And, and, and that's good from the growth side, uh, but it may not be good to get that last mile of that 3%, 3.5% inflation down to the 2% target. Jeff, thank you. Jeffrey Rosenberg, most often with us here on Jobs Day with BlackRock and his good work in a shorter term uh, paper as well. going to do now is wrap around that important Washington interview with the interview that matters for global Wall Street. Jerome Schneider, legendary at PIMCO in the short-term paper space, and we're thrilled he could join us uh, this morning. Jerome, not so much what this job report does. How hard is it to manage the risks of short-term paper right now? Yeah, good morning. Uh, Good morning, Tom, and good morning, Manis. Um, the reality is, is that a lot of clients are been positioned to be pretty defensive in 2023, and I guess when you see this latest data, we find ourselves in a confluence of events which the outlook will continue to recalibrate. The issue with short-term paper really is it's quite attractive, and, and that issue is uh, one where investors need to find balance between harvesting the attractive yields at the front end of the yield curve with the opportunity set to own a little bit of interest rate exposure and income further out the curve, and that challenge will continue to be reconciled as we get into 2024. So that's the prospect where you know the challenge from understanding the data and, more importantly, the investment the, the investment landscape really it will tend to reconcile. Um, well, any one data point, as we witnessed this morning, uh, isn't necessarily as important. Uh, and, and the Federal Reserve will continue to sort of put the emphasis on the longer-term views uh, when they meet next week. So for investors, they should do the same thing. Take a longer-term view, understand that interest rates have greatly recalibrated from where we've come from in 2022, and more importantly, look at the broader landscape of, of opportunity sets that, yes, you might have a softer economy, but the likelihood of a soft landing, while a possibility, isn't a high probability. And that you know, pretends to be a fairly attractive investment outlook, for at least for fixed income over the next 12 months. 
Good day to you, Jerome. Good, good to be on air with you. I mean, we had a wonderful line from Mike McKee a moment ago where he said, look, you know, the bond, bond market traders and, and salespeople have the attention span of a two-year-old. Having been slaughtered by the bond market in 1994, you get moments like this of where tens uh, and twos and tens have, have bolted higher this morning. Is it, is it just a bit of a wake-up call that the trajectory on rates is not one way? It's not a collapsing, falling knife all the way. There will be moments of interruptions which present opportunity. Well, yeah, you're trying to get an insight to the practitioner's frame of mind. And then right, honestly, man, it's, it's one of those things that from a, a data dependent point of view, yes, the attention span might be one of the two year old, if that's the view you take. And that's why we suggest at PIMCO to take a longer term view. The The practicality of it is, is that the, the bond market has effectively challenged in many ways the Fed's resolve many times this year, probably five or six times by my account. Mm. And we're, they're going to continue to do so. One of the one of the largest uh, challenges will be actually over the next week as we take a look at the dot plots uh, that will be revealed, and, and that will ultimately suggest that perhaps the Fed only suggests a handful of rate cuts versus the Fed's you know, remaining five plus um, versus the markets, rather, five plus rate cuts that they're expecting. And, and that is a fairly big reconciliation that can have fairly large impacts across the curve. But where I do, right. where my domain is, which is in the front end of the yield curve. How do you respond to risk of reinvestment? The idea is somebody is picking out a duration and financial advisors say, oh, but the risk of reinvestment. How do you respond to that, Jerome? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's where you have to have a diversified portfolio. And, and while the, there is attraction to be at the front end of the yield curve, and, and you know, Tom, that I, I'm a big proponent of being of being in just outside that cash landscape of the money markets, the reality is is that there are attractive yields, both in real terms and nominal terms at this point in time. And the risk of reinvestment is one where you actually want to balance the income, which is a heck of a lot more attractive right now, with the opportunity of capital preservation and, more importantly, uh, total return, which is going to be emphasized by capital appreciation over the course of the next few years as spreads as spreads normalize and more importantly as you you perhaps get to a an economy which is more supported by the fed which might be in later 2024 or 25 which means those rate cuts means bond prices go higher so that's where you want to think about that reinvestment risk and sort of takes them off the table by moving ever so slightly out the yield curve and adding a little bit of interest rate exposure Jerome, I'm just trying to work out what kind of flow comes into the shorter end of the curve across 2024. Money market funds, a new peak, $5.9 trillion. Are How you much a former bond trader? Well, I was a very bad sale. I was a terrible crack spread and oil commodity trader. Uh, but I didn't do too bad you with the bonds. You sound so authentic. I sound like a fool. You start flow. No, I think, you know, you, you, like I think we've got Schneider PIMCO talk. on the line here. They're the pros. Please. Please. <laughs> Please. Well, well man, you sound, you, sound, you sound a bit of an expert, so maybe we'll take you for a... For, for uh, maybe I can get a job at PIMCO. Listen, that, that's a long time ago. First Chicago, many, many, many years ago. Money market funds, $5.9 trillion. How much of that flows out of cash and into the short end of the curve? Is that a bump that you get? We, we begin to see it happen, but you know the effect is going to be the trade-off between the Fed's outlook, which will be cautious, but yet perhaps pivoting to that dovish aspect later on in 24. And at the same time, investors still want to harvest those high yields. So the resolve of the money market fund investors will be actually quite high. We expect that the investors will continue to be in that six, approximately $6 trillion money market fund for quite some time. But we're actually quite you know, quite in, in excited by the fact that investors are beginning to see that balance, to begin to rationalize the risks in a more quantitative way, if you will, because they're thinking about the volatility in the market, the outlook of the market, and realizing that the story of capital appreciation, which has been so relevant and prevalent in the landscape of risk assets, equities, etc., for the past decade, might be changing, and that might require right. a slightly different allocation. Jerome Schneider with us with PIMCO, had a short-term portfolio management. We're thrilled he can find time to stay with us in the early West Coast. Subscribe to the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live every weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can watch us live on Bloomberg Television and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Thanks for listening. I'm Tom Keen, and this is Bloomberg.